And so, so we're finding it has, has just tremendous impact on the audience and on the musicians. It, the, the musicians who are writing their own music, when they're writing their own music, they use this actually in creativity. We have a, an, a university that's very interested in using this to do dance choreography. They were, they're going to take it up and put it up on one of those, I forget what it's called, there's a term for it, it's a big high ladder and they actually will shoot the patterning of the dance in the light on the floor and use that to help design their choreography. So that's just another application for it. And we recently did an installation at a museum and um, what we did is we used a back projection screen with a low-level KISS laser showing the chymotropic imaging. And um, now we're trying to curate an entire sonic art exhibit there, so we hope that comes comes to fruition. The the laser we're trying we have it built where it is very affordable. The um, the price that you would pay to rent a laser, a low level laser, we have it structured where you because it's under it's a five milliwatt, uh, you can take and can purchase it for less than you can rent it for. If it's over 5 milliwatt, then you've got to get certified. You've got to get permits every time you use it. We can help you get set up to do that, but that's not... Um, most people that are using this use it for small performance. And of course, you have a price, price break that's going to go up You know when you're using higher level lasers because of the things that go with it. But as far as a, a tool for composition, a tool for choreography, a tool for helping musicians in small performances, it's a it's a perfect tool and it can be amended to do big venues I mean we can take them do the whole side of a building with it we can take a chymotropic imaging and just do it the entire side of a skyscraper but it's sound driven and so you have to have an amplifier to raise it up it's it's great fun and then uh, we have add-on equipment that can go with that to add different effects to the laser but to get it affordable we've got it down where literally a band could buy it and we will even finance it for them. We have a financing company that was really interested in what we're doing as a form of, of actually activating people with truthful media. And so they're offering to help us with providing financing. They have to qualify for it, you know, they've got to have a job of some sort, but where they can actually make monthly payments and buy the equipment. And so it's, it's fun, we're getting there. And, um, and everybody that's seen it has just been amazed with it. But more importantly, what this does is the KISS laser shows us what these sound codes are that we're trying to teach to the cetaceans. And it turns out the musical score is how a dolphin hears and speaks. And dolphins do something called sonoluminescence. Sonoluminescence is where they take and they sing a sound in the water and it makes a light bubble and then they play with it. Now, I don't know what those frequencies are that they're using because I haven't been down underwater with, with a dolphin taking the pictures, but from my study of the oscilloscope and the KISS laser, what they appear to be making and playing with are one to one and one to two ratios. But that may not be exactly scientific. That's just what it looks like when I see the film of dolphins doing these sonoluminescent bubbles. Water sonication, according to the water scientists that we've been working with, they say, you know, this pattern is, is really interesting. And it appears to be exactly how you're going to build equipment. It's actually, you know, an electromagnetic design. But they've never heard of water sonication of working except at the sonar level. Now, water sonication is purifying the water with sound. Well, when we teach the codes to the dolphins, then what happens is they can take it, the sound sonar. And when they take it sonar, the sound travels through the water, activates the crystals that are tuned to those frequencies, and literally ripples all around the grid lines all around the earth. And so that's the, the crystals work like transceivers. They both send and receive information. So they're literally crystal grid lines that the dolphins will activate with the sound charge. 
And, and then we also believe this may be the patterning that we've created may be a way, it's how you join a binary to a trinary system. So it's the way that you can make computers speak to each other and it also appears to be the way that you can maybe create a programming language to be able to speak with dolphins, to understand what they're saying. So we're just, we're having a lot of fun with this. Just a lot of fun. Thank you, Judy. That was so amazing. Um, so, uh, would you say that primarily the work that you're doing is on a planetary scale? Or do you work with, you know, individual healing? Well, I've worked a lot with my own individual healing. I think pushing burns out that have been suppressed for 21 years is pretty awesome stuff. I mean, um, uh, if you'd told me that this was going to happen years ago, I would have said absolutely not. Um, because it wouldn't have been in my frame of reference. And after having experienced it and having seen other people make profound shifts. Now, one of the things that, that I need to tell you, when we started specifically working with these frequencies with tuning forks, what happened is a whole group of us suddenly noticed that the plates in our heads shifted. It was just like we got holes, new holes in our head, new, new not holes, but dents. So it was a form of natural tree panning. Tree panning is where they actually, for medical purposes, will drill a hole in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain. We stopped getting headaches. I mean, this isn't one or two people. This is like a whole group of us that were using these specific frequencies and using these specific frequencies with tuning forks. So I was speaking about this, and, and I had a, a gentleman come up to me the next day, and um, he said, he says, I'm an osteopathic physician. And before I became an osteopathic physician, I was an electrical engineer. And my specialty now is cranial sacral therapy. Could I examine your head? <laughs> well, when they do cranial sacral, they feel all over your head, so it feels like somebody's shampooing your hair, you know. And it feels wonderful. So I'm just like, oh, yes. <laughs> so, and the man was like six foot tall, six foot five. I mean, he was really a tall man. So he's just, you know, doesn't even have his arms hardly bent to discover my head. And he's like, he's like, oh, you really have huge holes in your head. You need to see a doctor about this. And I looked at him and I said, I thought you were a doctor. <laughs> and he laughed. And he says, no, he says, I've never had anybody who's had these spots and you've got a few that aren't where the plates are and he said I don't want to disbelieve you but maybe you better you know get this checked out and I said it didn't just happen to me it happened to other people and so I subsequently brought in some more people and so he, he examined uh, Lori's head and and he's just like oh my gosh the holes are in the same spot the dents are in the same identical spot and Lori told him, you know, he had a couple of years to quit massaging your head. <laughs> She's a massage therapist. And then, um, then he examined another friend's head. And she also had the same spot. And he says, does anybody have any medical studies that were done before this occurred? And I said, I have a brain scan and a CAT scan. And he goes, this is really important. You need to go get another one. And I'm like... I don't think I want to expose my head to that, but um, I'll think about it. And so I'm thinking about going and getting it just to do a comparative study because those scans were done, oh, one of them was done probably 15 years before, and the other one was done three or four years before I started working with the tuning forks. So we may actually have some kind of medical you know, correlation, but I'm not so sure I want to go get another brain scan or a CAT scan. The CAT scan was, was um, okay, the brain scan, they gave me a dye that I did not react well to, so mm -hmm. I don't know if, I, I want to talk to the doctor more to find out if I can do it without the dye, if, you'll be, if they'll be able to see results from it, but I'm really not wanting to go do a brain scan. <laughs> I'd rather spend the money on, on doing more sonic research than, than that. So what, tell us about the, the specific frequencies um, and the Zobe and, and what that's all about. Okay, the, when, um, let me back up. In 1993 and 1994, 
I had two glyphs that appeared in my backyard and I heard them as they were being made. The first one was in sand and the second one was in snow and I heard the tones as they were made. It took me until four years ago to find out what the ratio was that actually made that sound. And then when I heard it, it was just like, yes, that's what it is. Then in 19, no, in 2002, I had a whole series of very unusual, unique events. And what happened was um, I had a voice that came through. And ever since I was a little girl, I have had a voice that communicated with me. And I thought it was my teddy bear talking. And, uh, and so I call it my teddy bear voice. But the voice that came through was different. It was softer, kinder, much more authoritarian, and sounded kind of like a great grandfather, like you imagine a great grandfather to sound. And I had just been gifted something that had the name Mojo on it. And it was exactly, exactly, minute description exactly what I had asked for 12 and a half hours earlier. And the name that was on it was Mojo. Well, Mojo to most people means magic, but in our family, Mojo is, was the name of my grandparents' dog. And one hour before my grandmother's funeral, my partner and I had to hire an attorney to save the dog's life, which we did. So Mojo to us means dog. <laughs> 